Yeah. But, oh, Jesus Christ. It's quite nice. Bam. <laughs> oh, shit on toast. Ooh. Wait, you haven't tamed anything, have you? No, I don't know how. Fuck. Please! Whoa, what the fuck? Oh, come on, I had to have hit him. Oh, I'm down. Fuck. I really enjoy open world survival games. Things like the Daisy mod or the Daisy standalone or Rust or Seven Days to Die. They're absolutely my cup of tea. For those not familiar at all, they're a relatively new-ish crop of games that involve dropping people into a big open map and then just having them fend for themselves, either against the environment or people or both. Survival games often stand in total contrast to the rest of the gaming industry as they put this overwhelming emphasis on player freedom. The developers still have influence, yes, they dictate how the game world works, but it's much more subtle. It requires thinking things through carefully, without the player being made aware that they're being directed. As a result, immersion, a quality that I personally feel is paramount to a decent game, comes very easy to the open world survival format. Many companies in the games industry often just copy what films are doing, using extremely structured story-driven narratives, motion capture with real actors, and player freedom, but only within a very limited margin. And whilst to each their own, those sorts of games just aren't for me. Sure, I can root for the struggles of a protagonist if I feel that they're well presented, but I can never reach that same level of immersion. I can't feel like the adventure is really mine when it feels like I'm being corralled into making two or three very specific choices, at least compared to the times where I know that the gloves are truly off. Should we rob shit? See who it is? Yeah, Should fucking rob, him? rob the fucker. Drop the guns, this is a stick up! It's a stick up! Oh, what the? What the oh, oh, it's Harry! It's my it's my musical <laughs> instrument. I have a bearskin rug. Do you want a bearskin rug? <laughs> what the fuck? Now I'm a sucker for innovation in gaming. I just love it. I really love to see new ideas emerge in a genre. Those moments where you go, ooh. That's a clever idea. It doesn't happen often, but when it does, ooh. When some new game is released, I really don't care about all the marketing hype. I wait for all of that crap to die down, and then I like to dig in and chop through its mechanics, asking what new ideas do you bring to the table of this particular genre? And the answer can vary wildly, from nothing at all to, oh, I don't know, popularizing a new game format worth collectively billions. I mean, I am slowly making some video essays talking about the DayZ mod and its impact, the ripples of which the games industry is still feeling. And in one of those video essays, I talked about how the customer base experimented with the survival game concept, presenting this diagram to explain it. I've since taken that and have tarted it up a bit, showing more of the broad strokes, as far as I can see them, for the survival game market as a whole. This will be relevant to a point I want to make coming up. So here we have the DayZ mod, launching in 2012, and it rapidly became popular, seeing a flurry of creative energy as players worked to make their own versions of it. From there, we saw various development studios come in and create their own zombie survival sandbox games, sometimes innovative and interesting, sometimes not so much. Fairly quickly though, we saw some great ideas branch off further, presenting game modes with completely different approaches to survival, some of which were also in inspired by voxel-based building games such as Minecraft a few years prior. This is where we saw the rise of the base building survival game mode. For years afterwards it felt like developers were releasing games with the same few words, you've heard them before, early access, base building, crafting, survival. This is basically why that happened. Hell, even franchises that, I'm sorry, had no business being in multiplayer open world survival were suddenly pivoting hard into that market, taking risks by just ignoring their previous customers. This was a trend and companies were going to ride it. The PvP category took a bit of time to get going, but eventually the more combat-focused DayZ mods crystallized into what we would now identify as Battle Royale, where the trappings of the survival genre are still pretty present. Big open world, semi-random start locations, you loot guns, you find each other, but it's intentionally cut down so you get to the shooty bits as soon as possible. Though it's noteworthy that this market was less spearheaded by customers and more by one man. 
player unknown, who banked on there being a thirst for a PvP heavy DayZ, and he was proven correct. Well done there. But nevertheless, a subgenre very much built on what came before, without a doubt. But you see, on doing this, on visualising it, you start to realise that the classic version of the survival genre, where there are a few bells and whistles, and it's just an open world, they've sort of faded a little bit over the years. To be fair, it's the sort of subgenre that's minimalist by design, and probably has something of a half-life, but it's kind of odd that it's faded away this much. Sure, there are plenty of survival games, but more often than not, they incorporate many of the features of base building now, which isn't bad at all, it's just a little different. Emphasis there is often on surviving multiple respawns and stockpiling resources for such, and the game often gives you the ability to modify your environment, be it with just building a home or full-on Minecraft-style terraforming. And, well, you see, that does a lot to change the nature of the survival experience. A great example would be Subnautica, which would probably be in the classic survival category, at least on paper, and its first half hour of play would be reflective of that, as you desperately try to obtain enough water to drink or food to eat, as the sole survivor of a nasty starship crash on an ocean planet. But the game fairly quickly incorporates a lot of base building elements, which gradually push at the dangers around you, making them much smaller, with the player able to build elaborate undersea homes, stocked with ever more nutritious food, in more or less a limitless supply. And also, it gives you the ability to build vehicles that simply become too big for most predators to interfere with, gradually reducing their threat. Again, this is not bad at all, and many games in this genre would be worse without these features. It's just that it's tamer. It's the difference between, say, 28 Days Later, where you're a survivor with very little overall control, and Robinson Crusoe, where the world can be bent to your needs. A little bit. Or, put another way, you're not getting better at jumping through the hoops, with the game having to provide smaller ones for the challenge. You are gradually making the hoops larger and easier to jump through with your progression. That is the difference between classic survival and base building. This probably also explains why base building survival games take a lot of inspiration from voxel based building games. That sort of progression and terraforming really goes hand in hand. But despite the drought in classic open world survival titles, there has been something very interesting happening here. A batch of games that are flying under the radar, and I'm keen to shine a spotlight on them. That's the purpose of this video, to simply highlight some interesting design choices that are being made here that are not only bucking the overall trend, but are doing it in a particularly clever way, and not simply aping DayZ for the millionth time, nor Minecraft for the bazillionth time, but have taken the classic survival game format, have tweaked it just a little bit, that also highlights the lack of imagination from so many developers in this market. I want to talk about a game called The Isle. A quick word of warning, maybe don't buy The Isle. Uh, I don't know, it, it's complicated. The development is in a bit of a weird stage where they're recoding everything, so I'm talking about legacy content that might not even exist by the time you watch this. Plus, there's lots of competition rising in this space, and if you'll forgive me, there's a bunch of drama stuff concerning the developers, which, well, I've not really dived into it, but they do come across as a bit uh, iffy. Just, just hold off for a second, just, just let me babble about it. I more just want to talk about the clever idea that it brings forward in what is now a very saturated market. So, The Isle is classic survival, extremely so. It is an early access game in which players load into a big open map, start in a random location, and then need to roam around and find food and water, and maybe fight if they encounter one another. That's it. That's more or less the whole gameplay loop in its entirety. And were it just that, then it would fade into the background behind dozens of other similar games with more features. But there are two big twists that make it stand out from the crowd. I'm gonna call them Twist A and Twist B. The first one is the obvious one, and the second is hidden, might be partially accidental, and is very, very interesting. Twist A. 
In the Isle, you are a player who is roaming around and surviving in this survival game, as you do. You might meet players in your travels, as you do. You might work together, or fight, or run, blah blah, so far, so standard. But whereas other games have you surviving, picking through houses for food, or for guns, or for scrap, or whatever, in what is probably the post-apocalypse, this one is set in a lush and beautiful jungle, and you can't pick through the remnants of some human society, because you are not human. You're a dinosaur. It's Jurassic Park, basically. A huge open map given over to some 200 or so players, all of whom are pretending to be dinosaurs, be it raptors stalking, or myosaurs grazing, or gallimimus is doing... Whatever the fuck that is. This is Twist A, mostly aesthetic, but not entirely, and it's a bit of a formula break, which immediately makes it stand out from the rest of the market, whether the developers know that or not. The DayZ mod and Minecraft, let's be fair, popularized a very familiar template. You're a humanoid, you have a first person perspective, usually, the ability to have an inventory and to craft things, to find ranged weapons and fire them in a big open map with nebulous PvP, but here, you're a dinosaur. You cannot pick up guns, you cannot find upgrades, you cannot craft stuff in your inventory because you have no inventory. Your weapons, be they for attack or defense, are built into your body and cannot be changed, and are always melee. Just think briefly on all the survival games you've played, including the base building ones. It's almost always humanoids, probably with an inventory, probably with a gun. Even games like The Stomping Lands or Ark, who directly include dinosaurs, only really treat them as vehicles, launching with the standard, you are human, you gather stuff, you craft that stuff, blah blah blah. So this small idea from the aisle, having players be animals, is a big change. In addition to this, there are some clever extras. Immersion has been focused on carefully, with excellent audio design. with each of the dinosaurs having their own unique calls. And there's no voice comms. Over time, you start to recognize the various roars that you hear throughout the jungle, being able to identify the species, the group size, and even the temperament of the players around you. Also, the dinosaurs have been given a real sense of weight. Rather than just bouncing around and spazzing out, they stomp and heave. And for some of them, just turning around is a tricky thing. You really feel like your dinosaur has a presence in the game world. The group chat system only lets you invite members of your own dinosaur species, which greatly encourages you to herd up with your own kind, further adding to the immersion. You'll see flocks of Gallimimus players running past, or packs of Dilophosauruses stalking together, or parasaurs nesting, that type of thing. You can hatch eggs which will let your friends spawn in directly at your location. Daisy standalone, take note. Nobody wants to spend the better part of an hour moving across the map just to start playing with your friends. The environmental challenges such as night and rain are not to be trifled with, as they can dramatically change your survival chances, with some species having dreadful night vision, making you more or less helpless the moment the sun goes down. With rainstorms, removing your ability to navigate by scent and find food. You may find yourself in desperate straits if you don't plan ahead. And whilst the global chat does let all species talk to each other, it's accompanied by an involuntary vocalization. All chat is. which is actually a pretty good idea, as you're sitting at night and you can hear Utah Raptors barking, and Parasaurs frumping, and T-Rexes roaring, all up into the night sky. It's all just players socializing in this great big dinosaur chat room. So that's twist A, that's the obvious one, that in the genre of open world let's be humans and loot stuff, here is one where you play as a non-human, selecting completely different species to determine what weapons you will have and what you can do, and it's experimenting with what this means gameplay wise. It's no doubt one of the more tempting things for people because, well, <laughs> let's be fair, dinosaurs are cool. There are competitors appearing here also, even one that breaks the formula and makes dragons. More on that soon. So Twist A has been noticed, but hidden underneath Twist A is Twist B. And this is the one I want to talk about. 
In open world survival games, you have what I call PVE internal requirements. That is to say, environmental challenges that a player must face. They dictate what actions they need to perform. Things like a hunger bar or thirst or tiredness or body temperature, that sort of thing. This is a big part of the survival in a survival game. And failing to satisfy these after a certain amount of time will usually result in the game punishing you, be it your player character being weakened or more often than not just dying and forcing you to start again. There's this great big video essay chapter for DayZ where I delve into this more. It's a work in progress, I'm sorry, the YouTube thing takes forever, holy shit. Effectively, these are the means by which a savvy developer is able to subtly control audience behaviour by forcing them to collect things to keep their progress and then controlling where those things are. Say for example you make a game where every player needs to find food and then players in the game will start searching through a few boxes and maybe find a Snickers. They snarf that down, their bar goes up, they stay alive for maybe another 30 minutes and it teaches them how this system works. But from time to time, if you're a smart developer, you throw them a difficult one. Like, oh no, I have a bacterial infection from an injury. I need to find antibiotics. And then you, as the developer, only put them in specific locations. Doing so lays out a challenge and increases the chances that players will run into each other trying to meet the same need, rather than just wandering around semi-aimlessly. This is bread and butter survival game stuff. Your PvE internal requirements are those items that the game demands that you collect and the developer plans out where they want those to be. Twist B for the aisle can be found within this mechanic, and there is a chance it's not entirely deliberate that the implementation of Twist A created it. Let's do a demonstration, see if you can spot it. Hi, I'm an Ankylosaurus. I've got a hammer on my bum. <laughs> oh look, there's a stream. Nom 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 nom. Hey, now I need some food. There's a big berry bush right here. Nom 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 nom. Sorted. This game is easy. Hello, I'm a parasaur. I have a trumpet for a face. Good, good. Oh, I need some water. Oh look, there's a lake. Nom 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 nom. Oh, I love water. Oh, I need some food. Oh, there's a small berry bush right here. Nom 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 nom. Wow, food and water is just all over the place. Hi, I'm a Tyrannosaurus Rex. I have really big teeth. I need some water. Oh, there's some in this stream right here. Nom 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 nom. Now I'm really hungry. I need... Hello? Uh, friendly? Twist B is, whilst half of the player classes are able to find their PvE resources around them, food literally grows on trees, the rest, playing as carnivores, physically can't do that. The developer has made it so that in order to simply exist in this survival world, they must eat the other players in it. No other open world survival game prior to the aisle has thought of that. Sure, there are plenty of ones that let you eat other players, but it's almost always framed as a negative. Rust has human meat massively dehydrate you. Daisy has it make you sick. But in this one, it's a total necessity, at least at a certain size. Whilst the carnivore players are able to start off eating these shitty little NPC dinosaurs that feed them as a baby, or when the server population is low, once you reach adults or have two or three players in a group, which happens quickly, it becomes pretty difficult to survive off the game world. You must hunt other players because that's where the meat is. Players who, surprise, do not want to get eaten. Do you, do you see the two big boys coming through over the open field in front of you? Oh, what are they? I don't know, but they're big and I don't want them to be here. Leave. Uh, leave? Yeah. Uh, yeah, leave, leave. We need to go. They are very big. It's a very simple game. But it's pretty yeah, intense. Don't die. That's literally it. Don't fucking die. 
Now, this radically changes the formula. What would be a fairly generic survival experience suddenly turns into an intense game of cat and mouse, where everybody from the largest giga to the smallest dibble is part of a simple food chain. The game has created a food chain and Twist B is forcing all players into it. Oh, oh yeah, it's sad. But yeah, no, this is. Oh shit, run, 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 run! Run, 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 some of these moments can be extremely intense. One moment you're in daylight with your herd and everything is fine, but then night falls and the carnivore players who have been stalking you all day hunt you in the darkness. A darkness that closes in all around you. Have you ever seen the film Pitch Black? Yeah, it's uh, it's this. I was supposed to die in France. Never ever saw France. Are they Dilophosauruses? Oh my god, that's terrifying. They're out there. And if you're a small dinosaur, you may opt to hide in dense foliage. But then, the carnivore players can scent part of the path that you've walked. So you may find yourself desperately hoping to avoid detection, as hungry players will try to circle in on your hiding spot. A high-stakes, high-adrenaline game of hide-and-seek. Everyone find a hedge and rest. Find a hedge and rest. I want to find a better one. Hang on. It's coming. It's coming. Oh, is it? It's coming. It's coming. Oh my gosh. I'm going to run out of stamina. <laughs> it's on me. <laughs> <laughs> it's miss me. It's coming for you. No, no, no. He's following your trail. He's following your scent. Oh, that. gosh. Even the carnivore players aren't safe. Sure, you may have big teeth, but you're still made of meat. Same as everyone else. Water, 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 water. Oh, hello. Oh, 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 oh. Whoa. Holy shit. Oh, the gig is in trouble. His leg's been broken. Oh, the gig is fucked. Look at that. Whoa. This small twist of taking some players' food requirements off the game world and slapping them directly onto players creates something extremely interesting. This is twist B, and oh my god, what a good twist. Battle Royale games have a similar thing going. The player objective is to hunt each other, but I think their fast-paced nature handicaps them somewhat. You lose your gear as quickly as you find it, usually. There are exceptions. Classic survival games are slow and deliberate, meaning that the tension, the adrenaline, the fear is so much more palpable. Also, in a meta sense, it's good for diffusing toxicity. Losing your full-grown Triceratops to a T-Rex attack after six hours of growth, yeah, it's frustrating, but it's softened by the knowledge that, well, T-Rex has got to eat. The player probably had no malice in his heart, it's just the reality of being the T-Rex class. You are always hungry. Think of all the times that you've been killed by bandit players in a survival game just for the lols. Here it's less likely because your attacker probably has a motivation you can sympathise with. They're hungry. There's a lot of us. There's a lot of us. Oh my god. This is so cool. <laughs> Oh, it's only a baby! Oh! <laughs> so, this is fantastic stuff, but it gets even more epic when I tell you what the players themselves have done in response to the aisle. A number of servers, notably the ones called Teutonic, have set up role-playing conditions in which players are further encouraged to behave as though they're a dinosaur, presumably realising how interesting this survival gameplay could be if enhanced. For those who watch the DayZ video essays, you may be getting some deja vu. Customers are modifying, be it through literal mods or in this case just server rules, a product in a direction that the developer may not have expected. For example, some of these role-playing rules. Rule 36. Herbivore players cannot attack unprovoked. They need to do aggressive calls to warn predator players to get back. Your weapons are defensive, therefore a herbivore should be playing as such. Rule 42. Almost all dinosaurs are allowed to herd but only in packs of up to a certain size, with special restrictions placed on apex predators, because, well, they're apex. They're not supposed to play well with others. And this also includes strict rules against carnivore and herbivore mingling. 
giggling. Rule 38. Herbivores cannot take revenge when a herd mate is slain by attacking the feasting carnivores. That's just not what herbivores do. The zebra don't bum rush the lions when one of their number is killed. And rule 34. Uh, not that one. If you are a special aquatic type of dinosaur, if you lie down in the water and stay still, players aren't allowed to hunt you if they are not aquatic themselves. They physically can, they can just walk over to the lake and press the mouse one button, but no lion dives into a murky river to try and hunt a hippo. That would be suicide. What I'm saying is that the customer response to Twist B has been very positive, with a lot of users totally on board for more, and great rules can elevate the gameplay into something truly unique and fascinating. A cat and mouse ecosystem game in which you feel like you're a dinosaur in your own little prehistoric world. Oh, fucking help. Oh shit, oh shit, oh shit, Jesus Christ, it's a Rex. Den Den just got his head bitten off, Jesus Christ. But of all of the rules, there is one in particular that is really interesting. See, the base game has a bit of a problem. If each of the dinosaur species are class selections, like I said, and you're locked into them for hours as they grow, why would anyone pick the shitty classes on purpose? Imagine Daisy or Rust, but the only weapon you could use is the one you select on spawning. Of course everyone is going to pick the sniper rifle. You'd be insane not to. In this case, for the Isle, everyone would go straight to the T-Rex or the Giga, the massive apex predators that dominate the map, rather than whatever that thing... <laughs> whatever that thing is. <laughs> I can't take that picture seriously. It's like, that's the, that's the best one they got? <laughs> Dude, do you have any snacks? <laughs> <laughs> the massive apex predators that dominate the map, rather than <laughs> sorry, <clears throat> everyone would go straight to the T Rex or the Giga. The massive apex predators that dominate the map, rather than this, <laughs> rather than this peculiar-looking herbivore. Well, the role-playing servers responded by attempting to course-correct the game's design flaw by enforcing something called the Body Down Rule. It goes something like this. When a hunt commences, the herbivores are running, the carnivores are chasing, but the moment any player dies, be it a herbivore through blood loss or a carnivore getting careless, the hunt stops on the role-playing servers. A body is down. It doesn't matter what the source of the meat is, meat is available. It centers the conflict around what it is supposed to be about. Your PvE requirement, food. If the Predator players continue the chase after this point, then an admin smacks them. They must instead camp the body and eat it, not leaving it until they've stripped the carcass bare, a process that might take up to an hour. This rule not only has the Predator players behave exactly as Predators do in real life, the lions don't take two bites out of their kill and then just keep chasing the herd, it immediately relieves the pressure on the herbivore players and makes them viable to play. Rather than just being non-stop hunted across every compass point, it forces the Predators to slow the fuck down, to give the herbivore players, with their much weaker classes, a breather. In fact, in many cases, it makes playing the weaker classes a lot more fun. Sometimes it's just more thrilling to be the chased rather than the chaser. I think we can hear. Oh, I see you. I see you. Oh my god. Okay, hello. Hi, how are you doing? I feel inadequate. Do you now? Yes, you guys can stay over there. Yeah, I'm right just, there, just actually. No, 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 you guys can stay right there. <laughs> oh, shit. Get the chicken. Furthermore, this creates a really interesting ritualistic play, in that with a body down, the carnivore players have no further need to be aggressive, and the herbivore players don't have to worry about being chased, since their pursuers are probably fed, and the other circling carnivores don't necessarily need to start a fresh hunt, not always anyway, they can try to beg for scraps off the kill, in fact it's really not uncommon to see a large T-Rex player making a big kill, only to find that the commotion attracts a pack of scavengers, who, through sheer weight of numbers, are able to challenge the Rex, who also, being fed and unwilling to risk seven hours of playtime growing his massive dinosaur, probably relinquishes his prize to the starving opportunists. They don't have to. They can stand their ground and fight, but if they fuck it up, then, well, they're back to square one as a baby Rex, looking like a moron.
This sort of gameplay, this player-driven ecosystem sim, is intensely fascinating. Come daybreak, you'll often find the carnivores have made a kill and are sitting there with bellies full, the herbivores are grazing and are just together hanging out, and after all the excitement of the hunt, everyone, apart from one or two unlucky buggers who are breakfast, is just relaxing, chatting, getting to know each other, and mingling in their own herds and packs that are... Ugh. It is helped by the fact that everyone is melee, so you can be in relatively close proximity to each other without worrying about someone else shooting you with a scoped weapon. Compare and contrast to other survival game communities, where the populations, through betrayal and dickery, are just a paranoid mess of twitchy players. Sure, let's not lump everybody together, there are role-playing communities out there too, but nothing like this. Here, the ritualistic play of role-playing servers, encouraging players to act as dinosaurs, built on PvE ideas that are forcing players to hunt each other as carnivores and herbivores, here's a gameplay loop that feels utterly unique. Shit, no! God damn! Fuck! No! Shit! <laughs> Out of the darkness, hunted, silent as anything. Bollocks. That's how it goes, folks. That was the aisle. Now then, in the following years after the Isles release, a number of other titles started to appear in that same space. Whilst not all of them are directly inspired by the Isle, they are definitely swimming in the same waters. They have mostly made playing as a dinosaur the main selling point, Twist A. But I'm fascinated to see if any of them have spotted Twist B, a player-driven ecosystem. So I couldn't contain my curiosity and I did some digging. First up, Saurian, released in 2017. Over a weekend, I downloaded an early access build and played for about an hour, roaming around in a recreation of Hell's Creek in a terrifying wasteland known only as Montana. It sounds positively dreadful. Once there, I spent some time roaming around as an avian-type dinosaur, with the developers going so far as to render it with feathers. In fact, a huge amount of the focus appears to be on making it as faithfully realistic as possible. It's a core selling point, with a main menu encyclopedia of flora and fauna that's in the game, and the names of the experts that they've consulted. And whilst it was interesting, I think this just might be a case of mistaken identity on my part. It appears to be inspired not at all by multiplayer open-world survival games, but as a class-based fighting game called Primal Carnage from 2012 and Primal Carnage Extinction from 2015, and it is exclusively single-player. There's talk about multiplayer maybe, but it's a stretch goal. Dinosaur survival game, yes, but no twist B. Next competitor, Path of Titans. This one looked very much like the Isle. In fact, there seems to be a bunch of behind-the-scenes drama stuff. Something about this being the product of a former disgruntled employee, or something along those lines. I don't really know the details. I managed to make an anonymous donation sufficient enough to access their work-in-progress build, and it is very work-in-progress, at least when I tried it. There really wasn't much there to distinguish it from the Isle, and they seem to be following the exact path of Berries in the Wild and Carnivore's Hunt hunting the herbivores, so maybe twist B. I'm gonna be honest, after a couple of hours of searching on a populated server, I found nobody. Whether they'll lean into the ecosystem thing remains to be seen. For this one, it is simply too early to glean anything substantial. Next competitor, Day of Dragons. This one actually surprised me for all the wrong reasons. Do you remember when I said during the DayZ video essays that some companies will just set up and create mimics? You know, just to ride the trend? Yeah, uh, that. <laughs> In fact, a lot of people on YouTube seem to be calling it an outright scam. Oh dear, oh dear. An asset flip, they claim. So this is where a developer buys the pre-made assets and then slings them together and then just sells it all immediately, without putting in any real effort. Whether or not that's the case, I'm not really interested. I only want to see if they are advancing ideas. They've got Twist A, a survival game where you don't play as a human, but that's it really. You just feed off these worms provided by the environment and there's a ton of them, Twist B has flown completely over its head. Appropriately, I suppose. 
Finally, Beasts of Bermuda, and this is where things got interesting. It appears that the developers for Bermuda have put in a lot more design legwork. Rather than just simple berries for herbivores and meat for carnivores, Bermuda subdivides the PvE requirements into further categories, and makes it so that certain species should target certain things for the right benefits, including one species of herbivore that has a totally unique food group, kelp. In addition, the carnivores get a similar treatment, with the distinction being made between meat, fish and carrion, with fresh meat only on the body downs, and carrion spawning all over the place naturally. Frustratingly though, as you've probably gleaned from that description, despite flirting with Twist B, I don't think Bermuda really grasped it. There's an absolute abundance of spawned carrion, both on land and in the ocean. I had no trouble staying well fed and even got overweight, just eating the meat sprawled around me in the the game world, and this was the highest population server I could find. The forcing of PvE requirements onto other players just it isn't really there. The cat and mouse gameplay never crystallizes, it just remains optional. On asking people, I was told that eventually you can grow large enough that the carrion won't quite suffice. But from what I gleaned, that could take quite some time. The figures that they were giving me were in weeks. If that's correct, that's that's mental. I, I don't think many players are going to see that. In the aisle, you're forced to start hunting players within the first, say, two to three hours, sometimes much less. It all depends on the species. Credit where it's due though, Beast of Bermuda is exactly the sort of thing that makes me so excited when I try looking underneath the hood of game design. You can see ideas start to evolve. Many of the role-playing ideas that I praise Teutonic for doing, Bermuda puts in by default. There is a comfort system in which your growth or even health is affected by say mingling with carnivores or going off solo as a herd animal in a storm. Hell, your dinosaur can just die by not behaving as it's supposed to. Through debuffs, that you ignore, whereas on a role-playing server you're just going to get a finger wagging from an admin. There is also the inclusion of flying dinosaurs and marine environments, which can radically change your perspectives and your challenges. It's almost like three survival maps that have been layered on top of each other, air, land and sea, with even a subcategory on land burrowers, who exist in their own little underground world of tunnels. Plenty of Minecraft memes on the subreddit there, unsurprisingly. Most of the other competitors have none of this. And finally, those weather events have been really beefed up. Storms will encourage you to hunker down or find caves. Tornadoes will make you leave the area. And the most amazing one, <laughs> monsoons that will cause rising sea levels, letting the massive ocean predators cruise deep inland to find the desperate trapped players clinging to ever-shrinking patches of soil. This is a fucking great idea. Effectively having one survival environment invade another Another one periodically. Alas, as much as I would love to praise it, I think Bermuda is always going to play second fiddle to the other competitors. The textures are really, really quite bad, as can be the audio. Listen to this dinosaur's tail, just listen to this stuff. Come on, that's like stock whip sound effect level here. The dinosaurs almost seem weightless in this engine. They glide and glitch over the terrain, which your camera clips through regularly. This footage that you're seeing right now, this isn't exaggerated. This isn't like some low gravity server. This is just what I recorded while I was there. And with all the color palettes being customized with these brightly colored dinosaurs, it looks very, uh, just cheaply made, which really is a shame. It perhaps wouldn't be such a problem if its competitors didn't look like, well, this. So, it's a bit of a shame, but it seems to me that the competitors aren't really grasping the really innovative idea here, and it's very simple. It is whoop and whoop making a big player-driven ecosystem, one that all are a part of and none can escape. Hell, other developers? There's a lot more room here, in this section of the market. You don't even have to do the dinosaur thing. You could easily have an open world game where players are mammals, surviving on the Serengeti, or fantasy creatures on an alien planet, or even insects in some random back garden. Imagine having 200 odd players roaming around as bugs, turned monstrous by the change of scale and good audio design. You could have some players being snails, low speed, high armor, butterfly players flapping from flower to flower, spider players trying to eat them, and stick insect players that are... You know what, never mind.
But still, player-run ecosystems. If developers play their cards right, it could be a wonderful subgenre. And to wrap up, do you mind if I have a bit of a whinge? This final part of the video has been reworked a couple of times because initially it was just the above. The Isle is doing something that feels fresh, that's nice, cut to credits. But as I've been putting this together, it's, it's made me kind of grumpy. We've had like, what, almost 10 years of this as consumers. Almost 10 years for developers to properly experiment with and take the format of survival in a bunch of different directions. And very few feel as though they actually are. Many of them are just recycling the same elements of the Daisy Mods zombie survival success, or Epoch's base building, or Minecraft's terraforming, or PUBG's battle royaling. It's a market that consists of a whole lot of collecting loot from an open environment, stashing it into a player inventory, building bases to store it all, with a convenient snapping system and storage containers, moving tools and weapons from a player inventory into rows of tiles somewhere on the screen that correspond to number keys on the keyboard, nebulous PvP with other survivors, or chasing yet another fucking random airdrop. Few games end up experimenting with the underlying mechanics of how players survive, how the world shapes them, and how the players interact with each other, meaning that everything is starting to feel so samey. And so the Isle is interesting because it demonstrates that if you start fiddling with the fundamentals, how the game world influences the players, and why they interact with each other, even if you're just a game community, or just someone who likes to dabble with mod creation, then you can make something that stands drastically apart from the competition. With just a little bit of tweaking in the right areas, you can make something that feels really quite new.